Good morning. I am John Sarushian, the Senior Associate Director for Business and Technology at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and 3D printing are changing industries in the workplace. They bring with them opportunities and challenges with major questions around issues of job disruption, productivity growth, inequality, and innovation. In the face of rapid technological change, policymakers have been thrust into the spotlight to act. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have two members of Congress leading these discussions uh, to talk about these emerging technologies and the issues they raise. Uh, let me introduce them right now. Uh, first with us is Congresswoman Robin Kelly. Congresswoman Kelly represents Illinois' second district in the U.S. House of Representatives. She currently serves as a member of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. And Congresswoman Kelly uh, also co-led an effort with Congressman Will Hurd and us at BPC, so we're excited to have her here again, uh, to create a national strategy on AI for Congress uh, that passed as a House resolution in 2020. So thank you for joining us, Congresswoman. Thank you. And uh, next is Congressman Jay Obernolte. Uh, Congressman Obernolte represents California's 23rd District in the House of Representatives. He also serves on the committee, uh, the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, uh, as well as the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Prior to Congress, uh, he worked as a video game developer, a business owner, and has a degree in computer science. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Uh, before we get to uh, our fireside chat, uh, for the audience, I just want to let you guys know that we will be taking questions toward the end of this fireside chat. Uh, so if you want to ask questions, you can ask us using the live chat function on YouTube and via Twitter using the hashtag BPC Live. Uh, with that, uh, let us begin. Artificial intelligence, virtual reality, low Earth orbit satellites, and blockchain are just some of the technologies we're looking at here at BPC. Uh, both of you are members of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. What, em what emerging technologies are you guys looking at uh, and what are the opportunities and challenges you think they bring for the workforce? And I'll start with you, Congresswoman Kelly. Well, as you uh, just alluded to, uh, I've been focused on uh, artificial intelligence. Nothing that I thought I would focus on, but uh, Rep. Will heard. <laughs> Right. Uh, drug me into the world, and I, I guess I'm glad that he did because we, I was able to learn, you know, a lot myself. So my uh, staff and I, we stuck with trying to learn more. Uh, we stayed with it, even though Will left me, but um, and trying to learn more about artificial intelligence. And really, as I always said to Will, my thing was really around workforce development and bias. And he was very interested in national security because I have the concern, what happens to my constituents and what about their education and awareness? Because so many people are afraid of it, quite frankly. And I was probably one of those people also until I learned more from my experiences with all of you. Great. Thank you, Congressman Kelly. And Congressman Obernolte, if you are there, uh, do you want to take the question? Sure. So, uh, you know, I think generative AI is going to be completely transformative uh, in a lot of different workplaces. Uh, I, I think that uh, it has the potential to be incredibly beneficial to uh, humanity, it's, I think we're going to see an explosion of uh, not only productivity, but also in human prosperity. But like any technological revolution, it's going to be extremely disruptive. And in a workplace context, we're already seeing the effects of that. If you look at the Hollywood writer's strike right now, generative AI is one of the central issues that's in dispute with the writers saying, uh, we want agreement that AI will not be used to write scripts. So we're left to grapple with this problem as a society. You know, is that a reasonable demand? Uh, you know, uh, in a way, it, no one can deny the fact that a worker in any creative industry 20 years from now is going to have to be adept at using AI. And it's not going to be something that replaces workers. It's going to be uh, something that makes workers more productive. And so a highly effective worker is going to be one who understands how to use technology to enhance their own productivity. So looking at the Hollywood writer strike, we ask ourselves the question, you know, is this, uh, is this going to result in more writers or uh, fewer writers or more writers? And of course, the, uh, the Writers Guild would say, uh, we're afraid that it'll be fewer writers. But there's an, uh, an alternative optimistic viewpoint, which says, 
that as generative AI drives down the cost of not only creating scripts, but also creating movies, that perhaps they'll be so inexpensive to make that you'll see an explosion of different pilot projects for in different mediums and you know uh, a, a variety of choice for consumers that no one's ever seen before that actually creates more jobs for script writers rather than fewer. So uh, that's the challenge for us as lawmakers is to be able to protect against the potential harms of AI without, uh, without preventing the explosion in productivity uh, and the explosion in prosperity that it has the potential to bring us. Great. Yeah, so a lot of issues have come up, uh, issues of bias, of job disruption, or leveraging AIs, or the way you described it, uh, Congressman Obernolte. Uh, you're both members of Congress. I'm sure you talk to a lot of constituents. Uh, next question is for you, Congresswoman. Uh, what do you say to constituents who do express anxiety about losing their job to automation? What, what's your sort of like advice to them, or what do you say you're working on in Congress to help address that issue? Well, actually, back in the district, we try to get more people involved and we do, you know, education and awareness because I think that's one of the problems that people don't understand the positive uh, capabilities or capacity of AI and they are afraid of uh, losing jobs or, or or they're afraid some of the communities I represent are underserved or unserved and some of my communities don't even have broadband. So when you talk about AI, that's foreign to some of them. So just uh, uh, taking them uh, to another level of education and awareness and uh, and talking to them about AI is around us now. <laughs> you know, it's with us now it, it, and it will be with us even more in the future. But just making sure that communities I represent aren't overlooked. There's investments in those communities. There's qualified people to take uh, the jobs in the community. But I, I think understanding and not being afraid of it is what I hear mostly and that um, it's going to take our jobs. But, um, and, and, you know, I talk to them about the benefits of it. And again, it's around, it's with us right now. Thank you, Congressman. And building on that thread, you also mentioned bias is a big issue that you're working on. That's one that we've looked at at BPC. So AI systems right. can uh, reflect existing biases in society based on data or assumptions that go in. They can exacerbate biases. Uh, now humans are biased too, so there's issues there. But what what uh, are you looking into when it comes to addressing the issue of bias? And are there any uh, policy uh, policies that you have or are looking into that you uh, think would be helpful in addressing that issue? Well, I think it comes back to workforce development to make sure that a diverse group of people are involved in AI or working in AI because, uh, you know, the people that put the, that are inputting have uh, have influence. And, and we have stories about, you know, people being arrested um, by the police and things like that, which doesn't build confidence or trust in people. And, and the police have been wrong, but they've dependent on AI. So I think one thing is making sure there's a diverse workforce working uh, in the AI arena and developing uh, AI is very important to us. And we've done a lot of different uh, things uh, around that, you know, exposing uh, young people to uh, the STEM careers and, um, you know, and cybersecurity, just all the technologies, things like that. So they will go into the profession. Great, thank you. And Congressman Obernolte, do you wanna take the bias question? Uh, and then maybe on top of that, uh, what do you uh, sort of, what are some policy levers you're thinking of in terms of bias, but other issues in AI that you think are worth uh, sort of uh, exploring more or you think worth passing legislation or some policy uh, action on? Right. Uh, yeah, I think the biased question is a very important one. Uh, and we have already seen uh, in a, the development of a couple of commonly used technologies, the in an unintentional introduction of bias. One well-publicized example being in facial recognition, uh, where uh, recognition algorithms originally did not detect people of color as well as they detected Caucasians. Uh, that was due to the, the lack of diversity in the training set. Uh, and then lately, the well-publicized issue of bias in automated uh, resume screeners. Uh, but I think it's important to note that in both of those cases, the bias was unintentional. Uh, and when we discover biases, we do our best to try and correct those biases. 
that's a very different situation than the intentional introduction of bias. And the reason why it's different is because uh, intentional expression of bias is already illegal, you know, particularly in domains such as uh, as hiring. So, you know, to the extent that someone is is uh, using a tool to um, you know, to discriminate, you know, that is against the law. It will continue to be against the law if they use AI to do it. So, I think it's very important to make a, a, a distinction between methods and outcomes. You know, and we regulate around the outcome, not the method. AI is a tool. Uh, using AI in a way that is against the law is just as illegal as using any other tool. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the other question that you that you wanted me to answer? Oh, uh, uh, regulatory framework. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I know this is an issue we're grappling with. We're, we're lawmakers, uh, you know, to us sometimes. Uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so you see governments around the world who are uh, rushing to establish regulatory frameworks around AI, you know, particularly the EU is probably the furthest uh, along in that effort, and I would say probably the furthest over their skis in that effort. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I think it's very important before we regulate to ask ourselves the question: Why are we regulating? Uh, what what do we hope to accomplish with regulation? Uh, it's not enough just to merely say we're the government. Regulation is what we do, and therefore this is new. We need to regulate it. Uh, we need to think about what we're trying to accomplish. And in the case of AI, I think it's very clear uh, that what we're trying to, what we need to accomplish is to mitigate uh, consumer harms. Uh, so if that's what we're going to do, we need to be very careful that we understand what the harms are that we're trying to prevent, because only then can we craft a framework that will guard against those harms. And I also think it's very important to differentiate between uh, disruption and harm, because like any technological revolution, AI is going to be extremely disruptive. It's going to be uh, social, socially disruptive. Uh, it's going to be economically disruptive. And although government has a role to play in mitigating the effects of that disruption, and particularly in the example you were just discussing with uh, with displaced workers, we, we have an obligation to, uh, to have a, safe, a safety net for those workers. Uh, we have an obligation to make sure that our young people are being trained uh, to to uh, with the skill sets they need to use AI in the ways that they'll be expected to. We need to to uh, make sure that that we motivate people to to uh, gravitate towards careers that they're in now, towards the careers of the future. So government has an obligation to do all of that. But if we misinterpret our role as government and instead try and prevent that uh, disruption, then we're also going to miss out on all of the benefits that AI is going to bring us. So uh, it, it's a difficult role to play, but I, I think that uh, that we have enough people in Congress that are educated on this issue uh, and that uh, that are motivated to uh, uh, to try and craft a regulatory framework that makes sense. Uh, that, that I'm optimistic we're going to get it right. And John, if I could just jump in, I actually addressed the EU around this issue. I was one of their witnesses um, a few years back, I think. And there seems to be a big difference in how we feel about the value of privacy, uh, where Americans uh, value our privacy. Oh, it's very important to us. And it seemed very different when I was speaking with them. Great. Thank you. Uh, and Congress, I'm going to stay with you then. Um, so one of the things we look into is, okay, so Congress makes laws, Congress does oversight, the agencies often execute the laws or do the regulation. Uh, how well do you think the different branches of government and the various agencies are working together on these matters, both Congress with the executive branch and also different agencies within the executive branch? Well, I recently co-sponsored the AI Accountability Act with Representative Josh Harder, and it calls upon the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Communication and Information to conduct a study on accountability measures for artificial intelligence systems. And uh, I believe that, you know, this legislation will help to better see where we all are and where we're working together or uh, not working together. Um, I, I don't, I can't really say I know how each um, agency is working with the other, but sometimes when there's too many agencies involved, it can get cumbersome and, uh, uh, or maybe one not totally clear on where the other one is at, but hopefully with this accountability um, act, uh, we can have better oversight, I guess. 
Great, thank you. And uh, Congressman Obernolte, uh, how do you see uh, cross sort of agency collaboration and just uh, different branches of government working together? And even Congress, how, how's, how's the level of bipartisanship on these issues? Well, I think it's very helpful that so many different agencies have started thinking about this. Uh, I think that most agencies ought to be thinking about this, the, the changes that AI are going to bring to not just society, but to governance. Uh, and I'm glad to see that, that many of them are. Uh, there's been a lot of good work that's been done. NIST has come out with a risk framework for AI that I think is, is really excellent work uh, and I think should be incorporated into any regulatory framework that we put together. Uh, the uh, White House OSTP has done some, uh, some great thinking work on this as well. Uh, I know the FTC has been looking at it. Uh, I think that we're going to have to decide what approach we take. And I think that one of the things that the EU has gotten wrong is that they are uh, preempting away from all of the uh, agent, other agencies the ability to regulate AI. They want to create a central bureaucracy for doing that. And I think that that's a mistake. I think what we need instead is a hub and spoke approach that maintains the different sectoral authorities that already exist. And let me tell you exactly what I mean by that uh, with an example. Uh, you know, the, the FDA right now uh, is already uh, establishing guidelines for medical device manufacturers that want to incorporate AI into their devices because they understand better than anyone else the regulatory challenges in protecting patient safety. Uh, the Department of Transportation is doing thinking about autonomous vehicles, uh, traffic laws for autonomous trucking, uh, and, and uh, you know, liability for accidents caused by a mistake that an autonomous vehicle might, uh, might create. You know, and they are best suited to do that. So I think it would be a mistake to preempt all of that authority away from the member agencies uh, into a separate bureaucracy. I think instead we should leverage the experience that those agencies have uh, with a hub and spoke approach where they're all the spokes and there's a hub, uh, you know, that, that does the deep thinking about, uh, you know, the higher order effects of AI on society and maybe does like an NTSB level, um, you know, accident analysis, if you will, when things go wrong. Uh, so that would be a very different approach from the EU. Thank you, Congressman. And uh, sort of you brought up all these different examples and different sectors, uses of AI. An issue that I'm interested in, I'm going to stay with you, Congressman, uh, is uh, the interaction of different technologies is often a very interesting topic for me. So for instance, how can you use a combination of robotics, artificial intelligence, and virtual reality to improve surgery or do telehealth? Uh, what, how do you think about sort of uh, the interaction of different technologies when it comes to workers and making public policy? Uh, yeah, it's it's a good question. Um, I think that uh, particularly talking about technical technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality, we have not even scratched the surface of the impact that those technologies are going to have uh, on everyday living. I mean, really, they've been very fringe. Uh, and I think that that's going to change. And uh, I don't know if you saw the uh, Apple announcement uh, for their augmented reality visor. Uh, you know, yesterday, which I mean, still is not mainstream. It's uh, it's not at a price point that that's affordable for most people. You know, but this is still, I think, uh, you know, kind of the the harbinger of what is going to come. Uh, and I think we're going to see a world fifty years from now where that kind of technology is commonplace and is incorporated in everything that we do. You know, the promise of the Google Glass a few years ago, you know, never was really realized. And, uh, you know, I think this is another step towards that, but but uh, I think it's going to be absolutely transformative. And if you want to talk about one sector that uh, AI and these technologies uh, as an intersection uh, will influence the most, I would say it's education. You know, already, if you look at the generative large language models like ChatGPT, uh, they are the best educational tool I think that's ever been devised. They can teach you most anything that you wanna learn about in whatever your particular learning style is, uh, and they're just going to get better. So I think what we're going to see is an incredible uh, democratization of education. Uh, I think your education is going to shift from something that we go and acquire before we enter the workforce, and then we use that education for a 50 year career. I think it's going to shift to a, a lifelong learning model where education is available to anyone on any topic at any time, and then we will be free to choose what we're educated about. Uh, and I think that's an incredibly exciting new world.
Great, thank you. Okay, so I have a question for the, from the audience. Uh, I'm gonna sort of give a more summarized version of this. So we've seen uh, sort of growth in productivity that uh, many say has been decoupled from sort of broad widespread uh, gains for uh, all. Uh, so the growth has not been as inclusive as, as people want. How do we ensure that the productivity gains uh, from AI and a lot of emerging technologies do not just benefit a few wealthy elites or uh, people in the tech sector and are shared across the board? I presume that's a question you've both been thinking about, uh, but I'd like to get your thoughts on uh, the issue and sort of some of the policy implications. And Congressman Kelly, if I can start with you, uh, that would be great. Sure. This is uh, a big concern uh, for me and the community that I represent. And actually, we actually brought a program to the south side of Chicago where we had AI uh, experts uh, dealing with some of our um, young college students. I don't think any were in high school and had a round table around that discussion, you know, around that issue. And I think, again, we need to diversify the workforce. We need to, as my colleague said, education is so, so, you know, very important to get people comfortable with it. Um, we need to talk about it in junior high school, in high school, and if you want to say even elementary school, so people know that it's just a regular part of life and it'll be a bigger part of life. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I just think we have to get people more engaged at an earlier age and with appropriate uh, education and awareness and make sure, again, that whether you live in a rural area, my district is urban, suburban, and rural. I have 2,000 farms that my farmers know that it's a benefit to them, to my suburban area and my urban area. Thank you, Congressman. And uh, Congressman Obernolte, do you want to take that question? Sure. Uh, I think it's an important question, and I think answering it's going to frame a lot of the way that we as a society think about AI. I also think, though, it's very important to define what we mean when we say equality, because uh, we're talking about a tool that is an incredible enhancer of productivity if you choose to use it. And so uh, I think that it, what we need to focus on is equality of opportunity, not necessarily equality of outcome. And this is something that we as a society have struggled with. Uh, you know, the, the, the whole concept of income inequality is one where we look at a society where uh, we, we believe it, we say we believe in free markets and, you know, people compete for goods and services. Uh, that is turned out to be the most beneficial framework for enhancing human uh, prosperity. I mean, for everybody, not just the people that benefit the most, but it does not result in equal outcomes. So I think what we need to strive for with AI is equal opportunity. I also think that if you look at uh, the amount of prosperity that we can add and you look at other technological revolutions that have occurred, you can see that uh, a huge in, an increase in prosperity uh, is worth having some differential outcomes in terms of income inequality. So uh, it's it's the, the phrase of rising tide lifts all ships, right? Uh, and as long as all of the ships are being lifted and everyone has the opportunity to benefit, I think we will have succeeded. Great. Thank you, Congressman. Okay. And uh, last question, and let's keep this to a minute if possible. Uh, can you give us your vision of what you want in the next 10 years uh, from AI and other emerging technologies and how we get there? What would you like to see and what would you like to avoid? And Congressman Kelly, I'll start with you, if that's okay. Oh, that's fine. We need to ensure that AI is being developed responsibly, first and foremost, with feedback of our communities that we do avoid the biases that we've talked about and that can sometimes be embedded in tech. And again, there needs to be robust, robust effort to train the public on AI and ensure that you know tools are accessible not only to large companies, but our small businesses as well. I, I just think that you know it's just it's important that we do this in an equitable uh, manner, but I expect in 10 years, you know, hopefully AI will just, you know, it'll be like, um, you know, turning on TV <laughs> or, you know, that people have gotten much more comfortable with it and much more educated about it. Thank you, Congresswoman. And uh, Congressman Obernolte, I'll give you the last word. What's your vision for the next 10 years? Well, I think we in Congress need to establish the right kind of regulatory framework for AI, one that 
allows our society to unlock the incredible gains in productivity and prosperity that AI will bring, while at the same time guarding against the substantial consumer harms that malicious use of AI uh, could, uh, could facilitate. Uh, and I think it's very important to get that right, because if we get it wrong on either end of those two extremes, we're not going to, to, uh, uh, to get to, to realize those gains. Uh, in the short term, I think we need to pass a digital data privacy standard at the federal level. That's something that we have been working hard on in the Energy and Commerce Committee. I am cautiously optimistic that we're going to succeed in putting a bill on the House floor this year uh, that accomplishes that. Uh, if you look at the potential harms in the short term that malicious use of AI could uh, could lead to, uh, the, the piercing of digital data privacy is among the foremost. So uh, this would be a meaningful step in the right direction and I think should definitely be job one for Congress. All right, thank you. And uh, thank you both. I think our time is up for the fireside chat and I know you're both busy people. Uh, so just wanna thank you both and uh, appreciate your time. Uh, and with that, I will uh, pivot over to the expert panel, but thank you both for your time, Congressman and Congresswoman. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we'll go to the expert panel portion. Today we have three expert panelists that I will quickly introduce and we're fortunate to have. Uh, Guy Ben Ishai is the head of economic policy research at Google, and he is here with us today. So thank you, Guy. Uh, Katya Klonova is next. Uh, she is the head of AI, labor, and the economy at the Partnership on AI. So thank you for joining us, Katya. And uh, last but not least is uh, Professor Avi Goldfarb. He is the Rotman Chair in Artificial Intelligence and Healthcare at the University of Toronto. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, before we get to the uh, moderated section, uh, we will be, again, taking questions from the audience. If you're watching online, uh, feel free to ask us questions using the live chat function on YouTube or using uh, Twitter with the hashtag BPC Live. That's hashtag BPC Live. Uh, okay, with that, let's begin the panel and thank you all for joining us. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, you, Guy, if that's okay. What emerging technologies do you think workers and policymakers should be thinking about? So we heard a lot about artificial intelligence. I'm sure that someone who works at Google, artificial intelligence is top of mind, but are there any other technologies that you are thinking about uh, or want to sort of discuss? Yeah, no, um, terrific. So first, John, uh, great to be here. Um, let me start by saying, um, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that we are witnessing an inflection point uh, when it comes to AI and generative AI. And if you consider, for example, you know, the tremendous amount of investments that we've seen, not just in foundational models, but uh, also in applications. If you think about the number of startups and the wide use cases that they're promoting and advancing, if you think about the frequent round of VC funding, and perhaps really most importantly, if we pause and consider the fact that AI as a technology delivers economic benefits that we have never seen before with any other predecessor technology. Um, I think it really, it, it leads to the realization that, um, you know, AI is not only the most profound innovation of our lifetime, it actually has a tremendous potential to generate economic benefits. Uh, and I think that's really important. Uh, so in terms of what I'm, what, you, know, you know, at least as an economist who works at Google, what my focus is, and I think you asked about policymakers, what that focus should be, in my mind, AI is, should be very mind front and center. And, you know, John, um, I would stop here, but, uh, you know, my tribe, my people, economists, we're, we really thrive. Uh, we're truly at our best when we say that things are more complicated. Um, so let me address that because uh, I am concerned. Uh, that we will not capitalize on AI's economic promise unless we address three critical challenges. And I think to some degree, we heard uh, members, the two members of Congress address all three in, in, their, uh, in, in their fireside chat just now. The first one, beyond the scientific discovery, we need to develop, to scale, to commercialize AI applications. Essentially, we need to make sure that the scientific breakthrough really translates to an economic success. Um, that is critical for uh, US global standing. 
we also need to make sure that we expand AI's footprint beyond the tech sector. And you can't uh, overstress the importance of making sure that small, medium businesses, as well as traditional industri industries like manufacturing and agriculture, uh, that they benefit from those, um, that they benefit from AI as well. And then finally, we need a policy agenda that promotes a workforce transition, ensuring that our US workforce is ready to transition to the new AI economy. So I'm incredibly optimistic about this once in a generation AI economic dividend. And I'm actually also optimistic that given this tremendous opportunity, we as a society will collectively come to find the right policy solutions. Hey, thank you, Guy. Uh, I'll turn it to Avi. Uh, if you wanna talk about uh, emerging technologies like AI and how they're gonna affect labor markets. So the jobs question is one we hear a lot about. Uh, we also hear a question about how it's gonna impact sort of the uh, distribution of wealth and income across society. Uh, so we've heard from the members, uh, sort of some, some of their takes, but uh, how do you see emerging tech affecting the labor market and incomes? And uh, thanks, John, and great to be part of this panel. Uh, the Congressman Obernalty said, uh, you know, we expect an explosion in productivity and explosion in prosperity. Um, I think that's right. I think that long run view is 100% uh, where we're going. This technology is really exciting and AI in particular, and uh, it could really transform the way we live in, for the better. The long run. And in that long run, um, there are to the extent that um, it makes us all wealthier, but we still want to work, um, then then we will. And I think the economic history tells us that there's not so much of a concern about jobs per se. So where does the concern, uh, what should you worry about? There's things to worry about in the short run, which is uh, you know that transformation can be disruptive. Some industries uh, will be hurt. Others uh, will be much, much better off. And so there is a reason to manage the transition. Um, and then even in the long run, there's reasons to worry about inequality, but there's reasons to be optimistic about inequality. So uh, what's happened over the past 40 years with the diffusion of the internet and computing has been what we call skill-biased technical change. And what that means is those of us who are good at abstract thinking have done better and better in the workforce, and everybody else has stayed the same, and some have even done worse. Now, what should we expect with AI? Um, if the future is like the past, then uh, increased inequality is something to worry about. Uh, but I think that doesn't have to be the future. I think this technology, there's reasons to be optimistic that the opposite is going to happen. And if you look at what generative tools do, in particular, they often do things that are currently done by people in the top quarter of the income distribution. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they're very good at writing. Uh, they're very good at uh, uh, you know, prediction type tasks. And so we can imagine what these technologies could do is empower all those people uh, whose job prospects are constrained by their, um, for example, their inability to sort of parse the rules of English grammar, uh, but they have other skills that they can bring to the workforce, uh, the workplace. I, I think there's there's reasons to expect a decrease in inequality. We can think about this as a debiasing technology. Okay, interesting, interesting. So you think there could be potential to decrease inequality, and that's an area I know is very debated among economists. Something that's going to exacerbate inequality considerably. Some would think it's going to and you know, be a major absolutely. job disruptor, and it's an important area of discussion. Um, Katya, I'm going to bring you in, and feel free to address that question, uh, but I'm gonna add a second question on top of it. Uh, what responsibilities do you think companies have when it comes to helping workers prepare for any disruption from emerging technology? Uh, and what about even when it comes to designing and putting governance structures around tools uh, used in the workplace? So it's not just questions around jobs and uh, income, it's also, are there any governance structures that need to be put in place? And then even uh, before you, using the AI tool, just designing it, what, what responsibilities do you think uh, companies have? Hi, John, thank you for this question. Thank you for having us. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so I am definitely sharing the optimist and the hope uh, for productivity growth, for shared prosperity growth that AI can bring. 
I, however, maybe I'm going to complicate this argument a little bit by saying that that's not going to be automatic and we should, you know, outside of um, hoping for that, we should also take proactive uh, steps to making sure that the future of shared prosperity is actually realized. Why? Because, you know, precisely for the reason that Avi described, the previous wave of you know, internet diffusion, computer diffusion, actually did not lift all boats. You know, there were workers whose real wages declined, which is not something we want to um, have repeated with AI. So what, what are some of the measures we could start taking? And there, is actually, there are actually measures that companies could take. As it happens, just yesterday, the Partnership on AI released guidelines for AI and shared prosperity, and we have recommendations there for AI companies, for policymakers, for unions. So let me just highlight a couple that you know, we suggest for companies. We really encourage companies to make sure that they provide meaningful, comprehensible explanations of the AI they're bringing into the workplace to their workers. They explain what data is be being collected, how it is used, why, and provide workers with an opportunity to opt out. And we really encourage companies to bring workers, frontline workers, not only their managers, to the table to really have a say about how AI is being brought into the workplace, what kind of AI is being brought, what it is used for. It's really, really important because this is the, the workers are the ultimate experts in their jobs. They can point out a lot of the opportunities to improve productivity, to improve uh, job quality and business processes. And so the, the, having them at the table is a way to unlock this productivity growth. Um, and, but, you know, sometimes, like, you would think this is really common sense in, uh, in a lot of ways, but we often do not see that happening. What we see happening is companies rushing to try to automate the whole job, eliminate the need for their workers with, you know, newly developed tools. And those tools often fall short. So you end up kind of partially automating something, still needing workers to clean up after the machine, um, you know, and do that kind of job that, that are, tend to be less reliable, less stable, more precarious. But you also heard the customer experience as anyone who interacted with a self-checkout kiosk or a robot customer service agent uh, could attest to. So um, it's, you know, the, the message to the company says there is this better way of using technology, um, which both enhances productivity and enhances job quality and results in better customer experience. And that usually does not result from a rush to try to automate and eliminate jobs. Great, thank you. And one question I'm kind of uh, want to explore a bit since we have uh, several economists on the panel is there is a decision companies have to make when it comes to uh, using a tool or AI system, because we're talking a lot about AI, though this panel is about emerging technology broadly, but there is a question companies often have when it comes to using a technology to automate versus augment. How do they make decisions? Or how do you guys uh, as economists see them making decisions around when to automate something, when to augment? Also at PPC, we make a distinction between automating entire jobs and tasks. So sometimes you don't automate the entire job, you automate specific tasks in a job and maybe augment others. But how do you guys think of automation versus augmentation when companies decide to do one or the other? Because this does get to the question around uh, jobs and uh, sort of like uh, shared prosperity or inequality. And oh, uh, I'll let um, you go first, obviously. I have a piece coming out next week on this. Um, Great. Okay. Well, it's good. And, <laughs> but push back. It says there's something a little bit misleading about that dichotomy because one person's automation is almost surely another's augmentation. And when we think about it at the economy level, if you're making something much, much more productive, uh, even if that does eliminate some jobs, that may make other parts of the economy much, uh, much, much more effective as well. So um, you know, one of the, for example, one of the industries that people are worried about is the law, okay, where uh, there are many ways in which uh, we could imagine automation of many jobs performed by, uh, especially by junior lawyers in large law firms. And uh, there's, there's reasons to worry about that, and there's reasons to worry about those jobs. On the other hand, for everybody else who's not a lawyer, having access to uh, cheaper legal representation would be fantastic and would enable um, many more of us to sort of navigate the and all sorts of great, great value. One person's automation is another's augmentation. Automate doctors, you might augment nurses. 
Um, and so thinking through this as a dichotomy and ultimately telling engineers and companies what they should do uh, can, uh, can end up um, creating augmentation of those jobs that are already high skilled. So I would argue, so John Markoff talks about automation in augmentation in his great book, Machines of Loving Grace. And uh, he talks about computing and the internet as augmentation technologies and AI as an automation technology. And that in an engineering sense makes, you know, was right. But computing and the internet increased inequality by augmenting the people who are at the top of the income scale already. And uh, we can imagine AI maybe reducing inequality. That was the hypothesis I put forward. Still a hypothesis, let me be clear. Uh, hypothesis I put forward that what it's doing is automating the tasks of people at the top of the income distribution. And in the process, it may augment uh, everybody else. Okay, uh, anyone else want to comment on that question? Well, um, John, maybe if I can jump in. Um, uh, I, I do agree with Avi. I think it's ultimately the marketplace that determines what gets automated and what gets um, augmented uh, rather than dictated by uh, firms unilaterally. Um, I, I do think another interesting aspect of this is that we need to keep in mind that technology tends to automate tasks, yeah. not occupations, right? And in that respect, it's really important to note, particularly with AI, that what I think we will see emerging is that we augment more, you know, that the, there's a sequence uh, of tasks, starting with kind of like the kind of like downstream and working your way to the upstream or the downstream or kind of like more basic mundane tasks such as like data collection and observations where at the top we're thinking of kind of like things that are unique to humans such as you know intelligence empathy and so forth i think we will increasingly see ai um aug sorry um automating the entry level the more basic tasks in that sequence actually creating jobs that are more meaningful and rewarding Thank you. And Kati, if you want to jump in, feel free to do so. Otherwise, I can uh, move on. Yeah, I think this is just such a such an important question because this exact recommendation, you know, augment and not displace is being given very frequently. And as Avi said, it's actually very difficult to give it to an engineer and ask them to execute on this. And we don't even know if this would be like a practically, you know, important thing to do um, because it's so ambiguous in real life. Um, you know, it's very important whether, you know, it, you might be automating tasks and if uh, products and goods and services become cheaper as a result, that might be wonderful as Avi described, but that doesn't always happen. So looking at like, is this happening in a, in a monopolistic environment where these cost savings might end up just, you know, being concentrated and not shared uh, with the consumers is important. Um, but, you know, that is not to say that that means we should completely excuse companies and developers from trying to think about these downstream consequences and what their their products are doing to labor demand at the end of the day. It's just, it's, it's a more complex picture than just looking at whether you're augmenting or displacing a task. Um, it's um, the, the full picture needs to be considered. Thank you. So uh, at BPC, we've looked into the questions around jobs and equality. And one thing is there's a lot of uncertainty. I think everyone on the panel agree that we have a lot of theories and hypotheses. We don't know. Like uh, history can guide us, but history isn't always, you know, going to be a reflection of the future. Uh, different economic models uh, can help us, you know, make certain projections. Again, economic models are often wrong. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and in the face of uncertainty, VPC thinks adaptability and resilience are very important. So make workers adaptable, build resilience, policymakers should in place the right policies to do that. Uh, so a question, and I'm gonna start with you, Avi. Uh, what can policymakers to do to prepare the workforce? Uh, so again, we have a lot of policymakers and their staff uh, sort of watching our events, reading our material. And what would you recommend to them in terms of specific policies uh, that they should explore or look into? Uh Congressman Albernerty um, and also Con Congresswoman Kelly talked about training. And I think um, whether it's a, a policy per se, but setting expectations that this idea that at 21 you graduate or 25 you graduate or, or 18 for that matter, and then you have your skills for life uh, is no longer going to be how uh, work plays out. We should just expect every decade or so, you're gonna to need to learn enough 
to develop an entirely new skill set at work. And whether that's you know whether that's a federal policy or a state policy or something else is is uh, is not my expertise. But the the expectation that uh, whatever your skills are now that deliver value at work, uh, that's wonderful. Just expect that ten years from now it'll be a different set of skills. Great. And uh, Katya, do you want to take that question as well? Yeah, I would love to. Uh, I I would love to see a couple things at least uh, outside of you know, resilience around like social safety nets and retraining programs that were already mentioned, which I completely agree with. Um, I think it would be really great to see foundational R&D around worker complementing AI and AI that deliberately tries to boost productivity of low wage workers specifically. If you, if you take a step back and look at the field of AI as a whole, there is so much of it is oriented around state-of-the-art benchmarks that are, in essence, about matching and beating human basic abilities around natural language processing, image recognition, et cetera, et cetera. And so it is no wonder that we get a lot of task automating uh, capability at the end of the day. So what would it look like to invest in figuring out what are the benchmarks, what are the government challenges potentially um, around building AI that deliberately, you know, optimizes towards hum human plus AI productivity, human plus AI teaming. That would be a different approach. It's underdeveloped right now. The other thing that I think is important to recognize that it's not like um, there there, there is no thumb on the scale right now in terms of like what kinds of incentives exist for uh, different AI users and applications. With our uh, capital to labor tax ratio, with um, labor mobility policy restrictions, we are creating massive incentives towards um, using AI to automate, to try to automate labor more and more. And there are like so many other uses of AI where we really need that innovation, you know, accelerating scientific discovery, making healthcare more affordable, et cetera, et cetera. So the, uh, the rush towards automate, uh, of automating human labor um, is, not the only, is not the only area that we need to incentivize and probably maybe not even the most important area which should be trying to incentivize uh, AI mm -hmm. users for. Yeah, please. I pose uh, an alternative, uh, which is so I, I the the framing of let's think about how to help the people in the uh, lower parts of the income distribution relative to the higher. I 100% agree with that. Um, one way to do that is to figure out how to automate what uh, the people at the top of the income distribution do, and to give those skills and those powers to people in the rest of the income distribution. And so, you know, that might be uh, looking stuff up uh, since, since Guy's here. Uh, it might be uh, other things, but automate what, rather than try to get augment everybody, I would argue that that's what the computer and, and the internet did and it increased inequality. Instead, a goal and a reasonable goal is to try to automate what happens at the top of the distribution. Automate diagnosis in medicine, for example. And that would empower all the other millions of medical professionals to be able to deliver better care. So it's a it's the same goal as you, but it, it's a it's an explicit research approach, and it's a different. I think we need a mixture of approaches. My concern is that we are a little bit narrow right now with uh, with what we're trying to do, and we could diversify, you know, and try more ideas about how to use AI. Yeah, but your idea is definitely very interesting and not discussed enough. I think. Okay, and one point I want to make, like we think in terms of real wages, so real wages, it's not just the wage you're paid, it's also the goods and services you can buy. So if AI makes the goods and services cheaper, especially things that lower income people uh, tend to buy, so food, housing, uh, that raises their real wages, so making goods and services cheaper. So that's, that's an interesting question around how AI can maybe uh, be geared towards sort of cost reduction for product services that low income people have as a way to sort of boost their real wages and reduce inequality or at least reduce poverty. Uh, so I think that's an important thing that people should think about. Uh, in terms of specific policies, one that BPC has in the past recommended and thinks, uh, you know, sort of matches some of the stuff that you were saying, Avi, is uh, lifelong learning we think is very important. And lifelong learning accounts is an area where you uh, constantly save money to do new training as the skills uh, change that are uh, sort of in demand in the marketplace. 
And that actually gets me to a question for Guy. Uh, so I often hear people ask what the skills of the future will be, because if we are thinking through, like, how do we uh, help people prepare for AI, the skills of the future, you know, becomes an important thing for us to try to recognize, identify, uh, and ideally skills that complement AI systems and other emerging technologies. Uh, but the question is, can we really project what these skills will be? Like, how good are we at knowing, okay, X skill is going to complement AI in the future? Uh, and if we are good at that, what are those skills? And if not, um, how, how should we be thinking about it uh, if, if we can't project those skills? Yeah. So, John, it's a really important and interesting question. I know that like maybe some of the audience may suspect that this is a little bit uh, kind of like abstract and generic, but it's really it, it's really challenging to know what will be the skills of the future because I don't think that we know what occupations will emerge as a result of AI, at least not today, not now. Um, you know, we know from, um, for example, from David Otter's uh, work at MIT that 60% of the US for workforce, 60% of employees today are in occupations that never existed before World War II. Uh, so, Technology will certainly continue and reshape and create new and better occupations. Uh, but the problem is that, you know, we don't know what they are at this point um, and they're con continually evolving. Uh, so it's really hard to actually know what would be the demand for skills in the future. Uh, just to tie this to the prior discussion that uh, Katya and Avi just mentioned, uh, completely agree for the absolute need for us to advance uh, workforce agenda around uh, the, an AI transition. The challenge, one of the cha one of the many challenges, is that we don't really know what those skills would be like. I'll just mention one more thing, and I think it's important to mention to think about the limitations of AI. And it's really important to know that AI cannot automate all tasks. And in fact, there are some traits that are uniquely human. I think I mentioned it before: intuition, empathy, judgment. Uh, those are things that will probably be very difficult, if not impossible, for AI to automate uh, or to replace. So the reason why this is important, the reason why we're focusing on the limitations or AI's comparative disadvantage, if you will, relative to humans, is that it will actually reshape jobs in a way that will enable us to be more human, more creative, more innovative, and more thoughtful in the future occupations that we have. So again, I, the skills are a tremendous uncertainty, but at least we know what the direction of occupations is. Okay, thank you, Guy. Um, so next question's for you, Katya. So we think about emerging technologies, uh, you know, in a variety of industries and sectors and education and workforce training. It's not just questions about how do we use education and workforce training to prepare workers for the you know, jobs of the future. Uh, but also how can technology enhance education and workforce training? And I'm especially interested in this question when it comes to uh, marginalized groups, underrepresented communities, low-income people. Is Are there ways we can sort of uh, use emerging technologies like AI, but even like virtual reality, augmented reality or two that I'm actually pretty excited about when it comes to sort of enhancing uh, education and workforce training. But how do you think about that? How do you think about using emerging tech to enhance education, workforce training, especially for people who are uh, low income, underrepresented, marginalized communities, or just, uh, you know, don't, don't get their fair shake often? I'm, I'm so excited about this, you know, and it can be a slippery slope sometime when you try to um, solve issues or uh, you know questions challenges that technology brings about with more technology but I think this is precisely um, you know the case where I think it can be really great training works workforce training um, and education in general is just really really difficult and the best thing we've ever discovered around this is teaching at the right level personalized tutoring is the best approach we know but it hasn't been scalable up until now. It's just really difficult to um, to pay for that for a lot of people. Um, and with AI, this is hopefully becoming possible for the first time um, at a scalable level around the globe. And opportunities that can unlock are tremendous, and I'm really excited about them. At the same time, I do want to acknowledge that we shouldn't just be relying on the hopes that we're going to retrain 
fast enough everyone at like the right scale, even though we should be trying really hard to do that. Uh, but I think we should be thinking um, deliberately about like what kinds of uses of AI we're bringing into the workplace, what, what kinds of technologies we're asking work workers to keep up with. And I agree with um, guys hope that AI is gonna really allow us to shine in what makes us uniquely human. At the same time, like this is often not what we're seeing happening in the low wage jobs. It's a lot of the times workers that are asked to um, to clean up after the machine, you know, and, and like their jobs become from the jobs of creators to the jobs of editors at best, or the um, augmentation to the machine, their assistance to the machine. That is not the way that like allows, you know, our best human um, qualities to shine. And so thinking about how do you reframe that? So it's genuinely AI that assists workers, not the other way around, is also going to be really helpful to make sure this is the productive training and we are training people um, genuinely for, for the skills that they're going to enjoy doing at work. Thank you. All right, we only have three minutes left. I know Avi and Katya have to leave pretty much right away. So uh, I have a question for the audience, which I'll ask, but I'll maybe add my own uh, spin or two. Uh, so an audience member is asking a question about a windfall clause uh, that ensures the benefits of AI are distributed. So they describe a windfall uh, AI as AI firms promising to donate a significant amount of their any profits they make. Uh, so what are your thoughts on that idea? But I'm going to sort of spin that question a bit and give you another option too. Uh, what are your like final thoughts or something from history that you want to sort of bring up uh, if you don't have opinions on the windfall clause question. So I'll start with you, Avi, because you have to leave uh, soon. So what's your take on that? Okay. Um, I think you know there's reasons to decide whether we tax capital enough generally, but taxing AI capital and not other capital will just slow down AI. And so uh, if, if we don't think we're taxing capital enough, let's increase capital income taxes. Um, and doing it AI specific will just slow down the most exciting technology relative to less exciting investments. Right. More generally, you know, the question about what can we learn from history? Uh, we can learn a lot from history, but uh, one of the challenges in learning from history is that it's not always the same story. Yeah, that's right. And so when we think about inequality in particular, some technologies increased inequality. We talked about computers and the internet, and some seem to have decreased it, like electricity and potentially the internal combustion engine. And so thinking through how that plays out with this new technology, it's not obvious uh, that we're destined for one or the other. And we need to think through more carefully uh, in the analogies of the current situation to the past and the underlying economics. Thank you, Avi. And Katya, I want to turn to, because I know you have to jump very soon. So uh, any last thoughts or any response to those two questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, I think that potential redistribution down the line can be very important. Uh, you know, AI is possibly the most transformative technology we've ever, you know, brought into uh, into life. Might generate um, a lot of prosperity and windfall in something like a windfall close might be helpful in redistributing that prosperity. I think the question and the devil is really in the details of how that is structured. Um, and does it slow down innovation, uh, as Avi said, or um, you know, is this inequitable distribution that actually is robust enough generation into generation? Great. Thank you, Katya. And I'll let you leave if you uh, have to. Uh, Guy, I'll conclude with you. So any last thoughts or any lessons from history or any of the questions we asked that you want to sort of uh, give your final thoughts on? Yeah, of course. The last person standing here. Um, I, I'm going to answer both questions with the same answer. Uh, we really have to think AI needs to be regulated and we need to think carefully about what we're trying to accomplish. I think we're trying to accomplish a balance between the duty to protect and promoting an innovative AI ecosystem. It is critical that we do so. I completely agree with Avi that I don't really know that taxing AI would move us towards that direction. And in a historical perspective, at a time when we can actually reverse US productivity slowdown, when we can actually address the declining share of labor, I think that may be a mistake. So I don't want to end with a negative note. I think I've said enough times, 
one cannot be optimistic enough about the economic potentials of this technology. We got to be really mindful about the challenges that we face so that we implement it and deploy it successfully across a wide reach of industries and businesses. Thank you, Guy. Really appreciate it. Uh, and with that, I just want to thank all our panelists, including the ones that uh, had to leave early. Uh, I want to thank Representative uh, Kelly and Representatives Kelly and Obernolte. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to uh, some people on VPC staff, Emily Burns, uh, Lucy Manning, uh, and our vendors. Uh, finally, I want to thank everyone who came here today uh, to join us. Uh, artificial intelligence, I guess, was the crux of the discussion today, uh, but I think there's a lot of other emerging technologies that we should be thinking about, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, you know, robotics, uh, that we you know, could have way more discussions around. Uh, but thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future.